Okay, welcome to my presentation. Um, well, we've seen on a previous slide what a block cipher is, um, so I can go over it quickly. It's a function that's essentially a permutation for a fixed key. If the key is secret, uh, oops. If the key is secret, then the message gets encrypted to a ciphertext in a bijective way. In many applications, however, you want to have some flexibility. We saw this in the previous presentation, but there are many other applications. And a way to get flexibility is by using this tweak. And the idea is that for every key and fixed tweak, the scheme behaves like a permutation. But if you change the tweak, you get an independent permutation. And there are many applications of tweakable block ciphers. Um, form of preserving encryption is one. Another one that's very popular is authenticated encryption. I would like to give you an example of this. Um, and this example is essentially OCB. So there are three versions of OCB, OCB uh, 1, 2, and 3. Um, but behind these schemes is essentially a tweakable block cipher based scheme. OCB is based on a block cipher, but if you look at how the proof is performed, how you can analyze the scheme, it's based on a tweakable block cipher, namely uh, this tweakable block cipher based scheme. So it's a bit technical, but essentially we have a message. The message M is padded into several blocks. And these blocks are then encrypted to ciphertext blocks um, using not a normal block cipher, but a tweakable uh, block cipher. And then also here we have associated data and a checksum of the message, which get authenticated. But the important part to note here is that we have a tweakable block cipher that transforms the, the, the messages, that does the cryptographic work. And the tweak of block cipher gets its input, of course, the key. But in addition, it gets its input a tweak. And this tweak consists of a nonce. The nonce n is a unique value for every evaluation. And it gets some tweak identifier, which identifies at which position, position in the scheme the tweak of block cipher is evaluated. This means that if you have two different evaluations of the scheme, the nonce will be different. But if you look at the same evaluation of the scheme, two different uh, evaluations, for instance, this one and this one, the tweak of block cipher calls occur at a different position, so they have a different tweak, in such a way that every evaluation of the tweak of block cipher is kind of independent. And that's a way how the, the OCB scheme is generically proven secure based on the tweak of block cipher. Um, the question now is how to design a block cipher. And a sim well, there is a way of designing it generically. So there, we always refer to the hasty pudding cipher as the first. A uh, tweakable cipher, more interesting right now is I think the Tweaky framework and Skinny and Mantis from crypto last year. Those are tweakable block cipher uh, designs from scratch. Uh, now the focus is on a generic design. So suppose you use a block cipher like AES, uh, construct a tweakable block cipher on top of this. And then the first formalization of tweakable block ciphers by Liskov et al, they already gave two uh, designs. So the first one is one that's based on two block cipher calls. Uh, with a tweak XORT in the middle. No one talks about this scheme anymore. Um, I think there's a good reason for this because alongside this one, they also introduced another one which is more efficient. So it's a scheme based on one block cipher call um, where the key goes to the block cipher and a universal hash function evaluation. So H is a universal hash function and a message just gets encrypted um, through this normal block cipher like AES where the block cipher call is masked with the universal hash function evaluated on the tweak. So this is uh, called LW2. It's really similar, essentially, essentially it's kind of a predecessor of XEX. And XEX is used in OCB, in XES disk encryption, and many Caesar candidates. So essentially it's used pretty much everywhere. Um, it's an efficient scheme, but it only achieves birthday bound security. So 2 to the n over 2 uh, security. What this means is that if the block cipher has a state size of n bits, then you can break the scheme in about 2 to the n over 2 evaluations. Um, if you take AES, AES has 128 bits, you can break the scheme in 2 to the power 64 bits, which is usually uh, okay if you refresh the key often enough. But if you take a lightweight block cipher or something like this, if you take a 64-bit block cipher, you only get 32 bits of security. And that's uh, not enough. So what we look for is essentially a scheme that achieves security beyond the birthday bound. So beyond 64 bits or beyond 2 to the n over 2 bits security. And a notable way to do this is essentially to glue together various evaluations of LLW2. So the picture here is essentially a cascade of sigma evaluations of LLW2. And uh, where for ease of, anal ease of analysis we have different, we have independent keys and universal hash function calls. 
Um, at Crypto 2012, Landacker et al. proved that if you glue together two evaluations, this construction achieves security up to 2 to the 2n over 3. So beyond birthday bound security. And there was a small flaw, so it was fixed by Proctor, but in the end we know that if you glue together two of them, you get 2 to the 2n over 3 security. Uh, Lampard Suren went further than this. They looked at the general cascade of an even number of rounds and proved that you get 2 to the sigma n divided by sigma plus 2. Acknowledging that it's probably not tied. So they conjectured, it's generally conjectured that you can get 2 to the sigma n divided by um, sigma plus 1 security. It also looks like this is the best we can get. So if you look at the table, what we see is we, we've got an efficient scheme but only birth of unsecure. You can get to improve, uh, beyond birth of you can even get to optimal security but only asymptotically. So if the cost, the number of block cipher evaluations, the number of universal hash function calls go to infinity, you get optimal security. And the question now is, can we do better? So can we get an optimally secure scheme uh, with, which is reasonably cheap? And to do so, um, we look at a slightly different um, approach. So if you look at the original formalization of Liskov et al. on three core block ciphers, they suggested that, well, the key is secret. It stays the same for a long time. The tweak changes a lot of times. So for efficiency reasons, changing the tweak should be cheaper than changing the key. But uh, Jean et al. considered it the other way around. Essentially what they said is, well, the attacker doesn't have access to the key, but the attacker has access to the tweak. So looking at it from this way to make it secure, changing the tweak should be, the tweak schedule should be stronger than the key schedule. And inspired by this, if you combine the two viewpoints, um, you come to the tweaky framework, which essentially blends the key and the tweak. Um, and there is a modular construction that already does this. Minamatsu did this in 2009. Uh, what it essentially does is the key, the tweak, gets encrypted to get a subkey, and the message is then encrypted with a subkey. And this one is beyond birthday one secure if the tweak is short enough. So if the tweak length is less than n over 2 bits, you get beyond birthday one security. You can stretch the tweak a bit, but you can never get to optimal security, 2 to the 2n over 3 at most. Uh, two years ago, we introduced two other uh, schemes where the incentive was a bit different. So it was the goal to, be, uh, to design a block cipher-based scheme just with a single key. So not two keys, not a key and a universal hash function, just a single uh, key. And we introduced two schemes. The first one is not that interesting for now, um, but they look similar. But essentially, the idea is that the key and the tweak get XORed. This will be the key to the block cipher. And the message is then encrypted using this block cipher masked with some value z, which is also coming from an encryption. So you, the, the masking and the key input to the block cipher are a function of the key and the tweak. And we proved that this scheme achieves security up to 2 to the n, optimal security, very efficiently with only two block cipher calls. And Wang et al. generalized it. They found some other constructions that were optimally secure. Um, but there is a twist. And this twist is that the security proof is in the ideal cipher model. So whereas the other schemes were in the standard model, this one is in the ideal cipher model. So if you look at the state of the art, you have the, the, the top part, top five rows are uh, not rekeying. So the, twe the key to the block cipher is always the same. That's hence the, the last column. The, tweak to the, the key to the block cipher is not influenced by the tweak. You can get optimal security only in the limit. In the other one, you can get optimal security fairly efficiently, but only in the ideal cipher model. And the question now is, can we get the best of both? So optimal security of an efficient scheme in the standard model. Um, and to try to get this, we have to dive into a proof. Um, I will not dive into the proof exactly, but essentially into the, into the proof technique. So if you look at this optimally secure scheme, how the proof essentially goes is as follows. So we have this scheme, we consider this scheme with an ideal cipher, and we compare it with an ideal tweakable permutation pi tilde. And the proof then go, is essentially a probabilistic argument and saying that if, you, if an attacker wants to distinguish these two schemes, so the scheme based on an ideal cipher E from an ideal permutation, it uh, succeeds with probability at most Q over 2 to the n, which means that the attacker has to make 2 to the n evaluations, which means optimal security. Now suppose we want to prove the scheme in a standard model. This means we start from a third box, or the first one. Um, which is this scheme based on any block cipher E. And now we want to prove that this scheme based on any block cipher E is indistinguishable from pi tilde. 
And the question now is how can we prove this? Um, well, if you look in the literature, if you look at fairly any symmetric key security proof, um, at least any proof I know of is done in a hybrid argument. So we just go from the first box to the second box, and then from the second to the third. So there is a slight inaccuracy here in the picture, but that's uh, just a minor thing. It's just for the sake of argument, this is how it's usually done. So the first step is we start from a normal block cipher, we replace the block cipher by its ideal equivalent at the cost of the security of the block cipher. So if we assume that the AES is a secure block cipher, we replace it by a random cipher at the cost of the AES security, and then we do a probabilistic argument and it gives, say, Q over two to the n. Okay, that's essentially every proof has this generic step. But now for our scheme, the key input to the block cipher is key plus T, the key plus the tweak. The attacker has influence on the key. And effectively, it is related key security what we need. So in this case, the attacker can make related key attacks on the block cipher. So in this case, we have the related key security of the block cipher. And can prove that for any block cipher, how good it is, you can break the related key security in the birthday bound. So whatever block cipher you take, you can find a related key attack, an XOR related key attack, in about 2 to the n over 2 queries. And this means that if we use this generic step, you can never prove optimal security of this scheme. It's even worse, you can only prove birthday bound security. And th this is weird if you look at it, because the attack here, this attack on the related key security of the block cipher, cannot be used to break this entire scheme. Because this attack only focuses on this isolated block cipher here, essentially. And in our case, it is masked. And this mask really frustrates the attack. So it looks like this generic step seems unnecessarily loose. So what we essentially have, we have two extremes. Uh, the bounds get a bit more, more complicated, but essentially what we say is this is the conjectured bound for cascaded LLW. Um, this is what we call the, the tweakable block cipher security of this mode against any attacker that makes Q evaluations and has T time or can make T offline evaluations. And the typical bound we see in a security proof then is like the, the, the block cipher security, which in this case is against an attacker with sigma q queries and about uh, t time, plus this probabilistic argument, which is non-optimal. Actually, this is the conjectured bound. It's not even proven yet. Um, but it is non-optimal. This one, if E is a very good cipher, then... Um, it's fair to assume that this is of the order t over 2 to the n. So it's kind of optimal. So the, the first term, the block, term, block cipher step is optimal, but the probabilistic step is not optimal. On the other hand, for MEN2, it's the other way around. In this case, the probabilistic argument is optimal, but the block cipher security is the related key security, and it's only birthday bound. So that one is not optimal. And what we want is we want to have uh, security. And it looks like this generic step is unavoidable. So what we want is that both terms are optimal. And if you look at the picture, we want to sit, well, these are the two extremes. You want to be somewhere in the middle. So we want to look at, can we design a block cipher um, where tweak rekeying, so changing the key using the tweak, is allowed, but only in a limited way. So here the attacker has full freedom. And in this case, the attacker has no freedom. So essentially, it looks like we should go somewhere in between. So the goal now is to design essentially a tweakable block cipher, T E tilde, uh, where we have a key input of, well, we have the same inputs, key input, tweak input, message goes to the cipher text. Internally, it uses a block cipher, where the key input to the block cipher is a function of the key and the tweak, and it may uh, change. So there is some tweak influence to the key, but it's limited. Essentially, suppose we have lambda different instances of the E, so essentially lambda different keys that can go to the block cipher, then we expect to get a bound, uh, hope to get a bound, essentially, of this form. So the bl tweakable block cipher security is upper bounded by the related key security of this underlying block cipher, um, which will probably be, at most, lambda t over 2 to the n, where lambda is the number of different instances. Um, in the paper, there is actually a proof that this is the bound that could be achieved then, um, if E is very good. You can do the analysis. Um, so if lambda is constant, if you have only a very limited amount of different instances, then this one is fairly optimal. And then you hope to get an optimally secure probability term. 
So this is quite a vague, so lambda different E instances. Let me give you an example, and this is a very silly example. So this is a treacle block cipher. We have a block cipher. We have the message. It gets encrypted through the block cipher to get the ciphertext. And we have the secret key everywhere. And we have a tweak. And the uh, key input to the block cipher is, in this case, the key plus the first tweak, key plus, uh, key plus the first bit, key plus the second bit, et cetera, of the tweak. Um, OK, so this is a tweak or block cipher. If you change the tweak, you get a different uh, permutation. One expects to get a bound of this form. So that this is the bound I copied from the previous slide. Um, how many block cipher instances do we have? We have two different instances. Namely, the key is secret and fixed. And in this case, we have the key or the key with the last bit flipped. So we have two different instances, two different instances of the uh, block cipher. And essentially, one can then show that if E is a very good block cipher, like AES, and this would be around lambda times t over 2 to the n. Lambda is 2, so 2 times t over 2 to the n, I think it's quite optimal. So 2 is almost 1, so this is quite optimal. Um, unfortunately, uh, suppose we have replaced the, the block cipher by a random permutation. Uh, the scheme is, of course, completely insecure. I mean, it's, it, this is a very naive example. I mean, if the attacker makes two queries with the same message, with the tweak only changed at the last bit, and then you can make uh, two forward queries and then two inverse. You can play around, and with forward queries, you can break it. But essentially, I try to get the message here that if you have only a limited amount of different key inputs, you can have some more flexibility, and hopefully, you can uh, design a scheme. But this brings me to my negative result, namely that it's not possible. So that you can never get any scheme, whatever you do, any scheme that's optimally secure. Um, and how we do this is essentially we look at the generalized scheme. So this, this looks very technical. It is also very technical. Um, but this essentially covers fairly any tweakable block cipher that is based on rho calls and rho plus sigma block cipher calls. So we have rho block cipher calls to do some pre-processing. These are independent of the message row uh, calls. And th then we have sigma calls essentially to transform the message to get the ciphertext. Um, so rho plus sigma for any row of uh, and sigma. And there are some mixing functions like AI pre, BI pre, AIs, and BIs. They need to satisfy certain conditions. I mean, the AIs need to be invertible here because you want to be able to invert the ciphertext. Um, we also require the mixing functions BI to be uniform. Uh, in a certain way. So there are some conditions, but it covers fairly any tweakable block cipher design. Um, and then we proved the, 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 the it's, I think it's quite of a, a, a strange result um, to a certain extent. Essentially, we proved that if we use this generic reduction, so if we use this generic standard to ideal reduction that everyone uses apparently, then achieving optimal security in the standard model for a scheme that does tweak rekeying is at least as hard as achieving it for a scheme that does not tweak rekeying. So stated differently, assuming that this reduction is necessary, assuming that this bound on cascaded LLW is the best we can get, so this 2 to the sigma n divided by sigma plus 1, that this is the best we can get without rekeying, then it's impossible to get optimal security with rekeying. So, um, it's, it's a conditional result. I assume that the proof technique is necessary. I assume that, uh, that cascaded LLW only achieves suboptimal security. Then you cannot get optimal security. Uh, the proof is very technical. It's a probabilistic argument. Um, but intuitively, it sounds quite easy. And essentially, intuitively, it corresponds to the idea that the bound always consists of two terms. So the block cipher security term and a prob probability term that either of those two is too high in whatever approach you take, in whatever scheme you take. And more generally, consider any possible uh, tweakable block cipher scheme of this form. So any possible scheme of this form. Um, and now we put some lambda. Lambda is essentially a threshold on the number of block cipher instances that occurs in the scheme. So if lambda is high, this means that there are many different key inputs possible to the block ciphers. If lambda is low, this means that there are uh, only a few different key instances to the block cipher. Um, now what we prove essentially is that if this lambda is too high, 
there are many different key inputs to the block cipher. And this block cipher security term, this ADF, the related key security term, it dominates the bound and you can never get optimal security. On the other hand, if lambda is too low, then this means that there is a large set of tweaks for which there is no tweak rekeying. So if lambda is very low, there is um, only very few different block cipher instances and you can identify a very large set of tweaks for which you don't have tweak rekeying. Um, and this large set is large enough actually to perform an attack. So essentially to consider this specific scheme for this specific set of tweaks for which there is no rekeying, but that scheme only achieves suboptimal security. So you cannot get optimal security. And essentially it turns out that even the best trade-off is not optimal. So whatever tweak, uh, tweak rekeyable scheme you take, um, it gives a potentially different value lambda and whatever lambda it gives you cannot get optimal uh, security. Um, I would like to stress again, I do not claim that optimal security is impossible. Um, however, I claim that if we use this proof technique we are aware of, um, then it is at least as hard as achieving optimal security um, using, for instance, cascaded LLW, which looks impossible. Um, in general, it, it raises the question, what does a security proof essentially mean? I mean, we have different models. What does a security proof in a model uh, mean? Uh, the simple answer is it, it means nothing. Because, I mean, it's, it's just a model. You have a different assumption on a scheme. I mean, if we assume the block cipher to be ideal, you can prove it most secure, but of course you have an ideality assumption. Um, but that's also the case for a standard model proof. If you assume that AES is an SPRP, then you can prove security, but you still assume that AES is an SPRP. And no, as far as I know, no one knows what's the SPRP security of, of AES. Of course, it's a different assumption. Ideally, we would like to have a weaker assumption like the standard model assumption. But it looks like for some schemes, the idle cipher model uh, bound could be closer to what's the actual security than the standard model bound. Um, I mentioned this LW2 conjecture. I think it's a very interesting conjecture. Uh, and a final problem is this, this standard reduction. This generic reduction of replacing any cipher by its ideal equivalent. Uh, can we do better? And there is a simple way of doing it better. Namely, instead of just isolating the block cipher with the key input, just isolating the block cipher with key input and the masking. So instead of looking at SPRP security, looking at something like masked SPRP security, uh, which is, of course, also a standard model assumption, but then the reduction is trivial because you get the exact same scheme. Uh, another approach is the thing what's uh, done, for instance, last year at Asia Crypt by Shrimpton and Tereshima. Yeah, Shrimpton and Tereshima, they looked at a different approach where they kind of weakened the ideal cipher model, but ultimately it's still an ideal model. And what we would like to go is to, we would like to go to a standard uh, model uh, proof. Uh, that concludes my presentation, so I would like to thank you for your attention.